Once again, we are very glad that uh, all of you could be present and we'll, uh, without wasting much time, I would like to give this time to Dr. Alman and we are thankful that he is there with us to teach and, uh, and willing to teach, not just one class and run away, but willing to teach uh, in a way that is that these subjects are taught at a seminary level, actually, uh, if you can really understand. Uh, at times, I feel we are blessed enough because even at seminaries, at certain places, we don't get to hear uh, with such uh, uh, clarity and with this great interaction. So we are blessed to have Dr. Alman here. And one word on wisdom literature, uh, I've been noticing we are dealing with one heretical teaching in uh, uh, Telangana and Andhra states, and uh, I'm surprised how much uh, of uh, the wisdom literature is being abused. Uh, in interpretation, and they try to give uh, an allegorical interpretation to every word uh, in the wisdom literature. And it looks like most of the wrong teachings are springing uh, from that literature. So I'm, I'm just uh, glad that Lord has given this opportunity to actually look into the wisdom literature and uh, try to understand. So please uh, encourage others. We know that a lot of bad things are happening, but also in God's provision, there are good things like these are also happening. So let's encourage and spread this word around so that uh, people might be uh, educated in a uh, in a right school of thought, I would say. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Alman, for doing this. And, and I see the great importance uh, for what we are doing. Uh, my appreciation is growing uh, for se sessions like this. Thank you. Thanks for your time. And please take your time. Well, I appreciate the background that you've given just now. And that will be helpful. Uh, let me make, make just a comment on what you said. Um, a word means nothing without a context. So I can't simply take a word out of a verse and, and uh, turn it and twist it in various directions and make it do anything I want it to do. The, the, the word means what it means in the context. And you know this because you've had arguments with other people over the meaning of a word. And you say, well, how did you get that out of what I said? And they said, well, you said this, and this word means this. And said, that's not what I meant at all. I meant that. And so you know that that's the case. God in communicating to us isn't giving us a code that we have to learn to, to, to decode. He's given us normal everyday language for the Old Testament. The normal everyday language was Hebrew. Uh, for the New Testament, the normal everyday language was Greek. And so we translate these into normal everyday Telugu or Tamil, or in my case, English, so that we can understand them. And, and this is the way things work. And now in light of that, we, we said some things last week that I want to illustrate and uh, press home upon us. Um, I'm not That's sure. Robin, but... Can you kindly look into the camera rather than the screen? Ah, if yes, I'm sorry. Um, I'll move my chair so that I can do that. Um, let's see, somehow I'm not connecting well with, with the PowerPoint. Um, move over this way. And then I can see you and you can see me perhaps. So <laughs> is that better? Uh, can you look at, at the camera? Where is the camera? Yeah, it's right in front of me. Oh, here. yeah. That, I think that's where you need to see once in a while at least. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, once in a but while. It, but... It's hard for me, not, as it is for you, it's hard not to look at faces. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. So, once, maybe once in a while you can just... Yes. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, back, back off this issue here, and perhaps that will help solve it. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to recognize the PowerPoint. Let me see what happens. What are you seeing? Uh, we don't see any change, so we still okay. see it. Uh, now, what are you seeing? 
still the same. Okay, I'm not uh, able to share my uh, my screens at this point. Uh, let me put the PowerPoint on the other screen and see if that makes a difference. Um, Okay. Um, Last time we were, you were able to do something and then I yeah. came. Out. I'm uh, probably doing the same thing here. Hmm. HIS. It says I have to quit and re rejoin Zoom. Yeah, please so do. If you I will be back in a minute. Yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry for the interruption, dear friends. Uh, Dr. Alvin should be back uh, soon. Proverb is true only in the circumstances in which it's intended to be applied. Uh, proverbs are not universal truth. They are general truth. Um, and in that respect, look at Proverbs 26, 4, and 5. We talked about these briefly last, last time, but let's go back and, and look at them again. In Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, I'm reading from the ESV translation, and uh, it handles them pretty well. Um, don't answer a fool according to his foolishness, or you will be like him yourself. That's verse 4. Verse 5, answer a fool according to his foolishness, or he will become wise in his own eyes. Well, which am I to do? Am I not to use uh, to answer a fool according to his foolishness, or am I supposed to answer a fool according to his foolishness, the two verses tell me to do two different things, and they don't, they don't work well. Um, so how, together, that is. So what am I to do here? In fact, as we mentioned last time, uh, these two verses almost led the rabbis to omit the book of Proverbs from the Old Testament canon because they, they perceived that there was a contradiction in these two verses. And there is, if I view a proverb as absolute truth. But if they're general truths, what, what do you mean? What's the difference between absolute truth and general truth? Well, uh, to, to clarify that, um, if, if, if these proverbs are absolutely true, then there's a contradiction in Scripture that means that these proverbs are initially present a barrier to understanding 
But when they're understood, when you come to perceive what they're actually saying, they become a brilliant light on the situations which they fit. They may be characterized by ambivalence. They're concrete, imaginative, and form an apt model of life. But when I talk about absolute and general truth, let me go back and see. I, I dealt with that someplace in this. Um, I'm sorry for the, uh, for the quick run through these issues. Um, uh, law or promise are statements of absolute truth. When God said, uh, you shall not murder, that's not something that's situational. You, you can never find a situation in which it's right to murder. And here I, I make a distinction because Hebrew does um, between murder and killing. Not all killing is murder. Do you agree with that? All right. Um, to kill, for example, um, in warfare, I, it, God commanded Israel to en engage in warfare, and that entailed you can't do warfare without killing the enemy. So if God commanded killing in warfare, and yet he prohibits murder, then there must be a distinction between murder and killing. Murder is always the wrongful taking of life, whether intentional or unintentional in the Old Testament. So the, ex the classic example in the law is if a man is chopping wood and the axe head on his axe flies off and hits his neighbor and kills him, then he is guilty of murder even though he didn't intend, and the text says he didn't hate his neighbor in the past. He, he, there was no premeditation to the murder. It was an accident. We would call that in English, um, oive, I've forgotten the term in English, um, um, but it's unintentional. It's not something you did. It, it, it happened because of negligent homicide. That's what we call it in English in America, negligent homicide. But that man can run to the city of refuge and be protected until the, the death of the high priest, and then he may return to his home. Um, so law or promise are statements of absolute truth. The difference, absolute truth is true at all times and under all circumstances. Doesn't ma matter what culture, we're talking about, it doesn't matter what era we're talking about, law, absolute truth is true, no matter historical circumstances, cultural backgrounds and circumstances, absolute truth is true for all cultures at all times in all places. General truth is true, but only in a proper context. So when I'm thinking about Proverbs 26, four and five, there are times when you're, you're engaged in a conversation with a fool. And if you, if you lower yourself to his own folly, you will become like him. So verse five or four is telling you, don't do that. Don't engage in the same folly as the fool. Don't become like a fool. Maintain your wisdom. But there are other times when you're in conversation with a fool and you must correct the fool you must show him the folly of his ways, answer a fool according to his folly. Um, so it's the part of wisdom to know when to apply verse four and when to apply verse five. <laughs> Does this make sense to you? I, I can see some of you, uh, only, only two of you are, are willing to be personally present in this meeting with me. But, <laughs> uh, um, and I, I want I, this first opportunity I've had to talk to Dr. Babu. Congratulations. I, I congratulated you on fa Facebook, but congratulations on your uh, graduation and the conferral of your doctorate. Brother, are you now on the faculty of the school where you got your doctorate?
he's he's got to arrange so that he can answer. Okay. I didn't get you. Uh, are you on the school that you graduated from? Jan Babgar. Yeah, uh, Uncle, I saw a cut it only. Okay, me PhD, college then at the Taylor's Pellard. College, college, but it's computer science, sir. He's got his doctorate in computer science, brother. Yes. Is he teaching on the faculty? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Well, a double congratulations. <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful to see you uh, reaching this goal. It's, it's, uh, so my task in studying the Proverbs is to see that these are general truth and to figure out the circumstances in which they apply. Uh, in regard to that, um, then uh, we, we may move past this material. Uh, as, as, as material that we've already looked at. Um, the Proverbs require effort to grasp the resemblance between the model and the generalization they communicate. So when I'm looking at a, a, a set of Proverbs, I need to stop thinking, in, in, first of all, only about the two-line proverb. I need to look at it in its context and realize that they're open to interpretation they are allusive. They, they don't directly describe the situation. They, they imply it. So the, the proverb is at least initially often opaque to us. The, the word opaque, I think probably you know, but just in case you don't, opaque would refer to something, for example, a glazed sheet of glass. A glazed sheet of glass you can see light coming through it, but you can't see the object behind the, the glazed glass. Yes, so I may have to I have may have to ponder what the proverb is telling me before I can I can see. Okay, this is what it's doing, and I have proposed looking at Proverbs thirteen four to eight. So will you turn there in your text? Uh, and I'm going to actually start with verse three. Uh, Hebrew uh, Proverbs 14, verse 3. The one who guards his mouth protects his life. The one who opens his lips invites ruin. The slacker craves, yet has nothing. But the diligent is fully satisfied. The righteous hate lying, but the wicked bring disgust and shame. Righteousness guards people of in integrity, but wickedness undermines the sinner. One person pretends to be rich, but has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, but has abundant wealth. Riches are a ransom for a person's life, but a per poor person hears no threat. Now, all of these make sense to us as we read them, but let's let's press a little farther and see that they really are opaque. We've got to, we've got to think more clearly about them. Verse, first, verse three, the one who guards his mouth protects his life. So uh, later we'll, we'll talk about the, the situation where you might be invited into the court of the king and you're to, to speak be, before the king or you're invited to the table of a rich person. What are you supposed to do with your mouth when you stand before the king and or when you're at the table of a rich person? Do you remember what Proverbs says? No, yes, no? Put a knife to your throat. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so wait a minute. The one who opens... If you open your lips, you invite ruin, yes? So the one who guards his mouth protects his life. So does that mean never speak? No. No. It means speak when it's appropriate. But be very wary 
and understand the circumstance that you're in about what you say, how much you say, and how and, and, and the way in which you say it. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the one who guards his mouth doesn't mean keep never say anything, but it's a, it means the idea is you got to open your lips and talk, but be very careful how you answer. When I did my, and Brother John Babu, you, <laughs> you will have the same similar experience um, on my doctoral oral comprehensive exam. Uh, I had to listen very carefully to the questions and ponder what, are they, what, what precise kind of information are they looking for so that I can give them the information they want and not say too much that will put my head in the noose and they can jerk it tight and hang me with it. <laughs> so so uh, you listen very carefully. You guard your lips, but you still have to open them when you stand in these situations. So the, op the, the opposition, the one who guards his mouth, protects his life, the one who opens his lips and bites ruin, doesn't mean always be quiet. It means you got to answer sometimes, but you got to be careful about how you answer. Verse four, the slacker craves and yet has nothing, but the diligent is fully satisfied. Always? Do people who work hard and work smart always have plenty? What do you think? Get no answers. Is a hardworking farmer always re uh, 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 rewarded with a with a good crop at harvest? No, because the rains may come at the wrong time, or the rains may not come at the right time, or a blight may strike the crop, or 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 or, and a hundred different things can happen. A war can break out and the, and the crop be trampled. Yes? So you, merely being diligent doesn't guarantee you wealth and prosperity. It, it is a general truth. It's not an absolute truth. Can you see this? And if you will go on through the rest of these, verse 5, the righteous hate lying, but the wicked bring disgust and shame. Always? Do the wicked always bring disgust and shame? No, often they get honor. And Proverbs recognizes that. So, is it always the case, absolute truth, that the wicked bring disgust and shame? The answer is, ultimately, that is the case, but, but temporally, and maybe for years in our experience, the wicked get honor and position, and wealth, and everything that the Proverbs offer to uh, the wise, uh, and so on. Verse uh, 6, righteousness guards people of integrity, but wickedness undermines the sinner. In, an, in a, in a uh, perfectly righteous world, this would be perfectly true, but we're not in a perfectly righteous world. Righteousness did not guard Jesus from crucifixion. Righteousness led him to crucifixion. Yes? Yeah. So is Jesus therefore not righteous? Or are these general truths not absolute truths? And so on. You could go on through the rest of this. And this is the kind of thing that we're talking about in the book of Proverbs. It takes effort to grasp the resemblance between the model and the generalization they communicate they are open to interpretation, and they are elusive, characterized by opacity, that is, lack of explicitness. So my task is not simply, and I haven't done really what we ought to do if we were going through this. I would want to look at every passage, for example, um, verse 3 there, Proverbs 13, 3. The one who guards his mouth protects his life. The one who opens his lips invites his own ruin. I would want to go through 
every passage in Proverbs that talks about speech and bring it all together and construct a concept of, of wise speech and foolish speech before I ultimately want to teach that verse. And until I have done that, I really haven't learned wisdom. I can't take one proverb verse and turn it into truth about all reality and all experience. So I have to be engaged not simply in looking at this verse three in Proverbs. I have to be looking at all of Proverbs and all that it says about, about speech before I can speak truth about Proverbs 13, three. Do you see how now this is a much larger enterprise than simply learning to study a proverb? Can you see this? It, it means you must gain, as it were, encyclopedic knowledge about wisdom um, in order to be able to understand any given proverb. Uh, let me give you an example, another example that's not in the notes here. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Um, um, I'll quote it. Uh, the, I'm, I have the ESV before me, but I'll quote it in King James. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. <laughs> there are only three problems in that verse. Only three interpretive problems in the verse. The word that's translated, translated train up is never translated train anyplace else in the Bible. It's the only place where it's trained that, where it's where it's translated that way. Uh, it gets close to that in Genesis 14, where Abraham goes out to war with the kings of the east, but uh, it really shouldn't be translated as trained there either. Lady. Yeah, um, it, it, it's different. So first problem is the word train up never means train up anyplace else. Number two, second problem is the word child. Um, I have here a youth in my text. How old is a youth? Oh, who is in teens to 40? <laughs> Brother Thompson, you said what? Who gets into teens probably up to the age of 40. We can still do it. Okay. Like, like Thompson. Yeah. <laughs> so is, is 40 where, that what you're approaching or is 40 what you have passed? No. <laughs> I'm still to approach. <laughs> it is yet to, yet to grow. <laughs> uh, it was only day before yesterday. I was 40. So <laughs> it, it, it seems so recent. <laughs> I just am struck by it. But um, yeah, in fact, the word in Hebrew uh, can refer to anyone from a baby in the womb to, a, um, to the armor bearer or to the spies that went into Canaan. So how old is a youth? I don't know. Uh, a, the the uh, uh, Jonathan's armor bearer was a youth. And what, what it appears to mean is um, someone who's still in training for full induction into a field of activity. So the armor bearer is the one who is being trained to be a full warrior in war, but the armor bearer is, is, is as much engaged in war as the, the great soldier, Jonathan, in this case, uh, uh, is engaged because they both go to the Philistine outpost and slaughter people. Yes. Are you with me here? Yeah. I, so I, wh what does it mean? We, we've assumed that train up a child in the way you should go means uh, uh, teach a child uh, the faith, teach a child wise behavior, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, 
Then the third problem, so the first problem is what does it mean to train up? No, second, what does, what does child mean or youth? And third is in the way he should go. And the uh, ESV reads, start a youth out on his way. But that's not a good translation of the Hebrew, frankly. In Hebrew, it's, it's a word that's made up of three elements, a preposition that means according to, uh, a noun, Derek, that means way, and a pronoun, his. Uh, so normally I would translate this according to his way. So why do we translate it? Um, start out a youth on his way in the ESV. Why do we translate it in, in uh, King James in the way he should go? There's no word, there's no verb there. Uh, so what is his way? And what, what does the word way mean? Well, the, way, the word way is one of the most common words in the Hebrew Bible. It, it occurs over and over and over and over again, hundreds of times, perhaps thousands of times in Hebrew. Um, I haven't looked at the statistics on it. But um, we've assumed that way is the way of wisdom. But what if the idea of, of these is different? What if the word train up which is used, for example, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, where uh, you're selecting the warriors to go to battle. And one of the, one of the criteria uh, that would exclude you from battle is if you have built a house and you have not, um, and, and our word is used here, you have not dedicated it. You have not entered into the the uh the house and and consecrated it to the lord so you haven't inaugurated its use um but training would be irrelevant it's the same word by the way it's the same word but training would be irrelevant to the meaning of that verse you don't train a house <laughs> so what would it mean maybe inaugurate would be a, a sound meaning here. The, the word youth would be someone who's still in his apprenticeship for his, his uh, life pursuit, whether it's a life pursuit as a potter, a life pursuit as a farmer, life pursuit as a soldier. So you're, you're, going, to, you're going to inaugurate him. His, his training is over and you inaugurate him into his work in a way that befits his profession. And, and that's a legitimate translation for the word way in Proverbs 22, 6. So can you see that these Proverbs do not simply yield to ready interpretation? I got to do a lot of thinking about them. Am I making sense with you on this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I am to Sukumar, but <laughs> I'm not sure that everybody else um, make him fit for a specific job. Yeah, so this is why this is why Dr. Babu, John Babu, we have graduation ceremonies. Uh, yeah, you want people. I saw you in your regalia uh, mm -hmm. on Facebook. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was such a joy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you. We give proper regalia, we go through the proper ceremonies for our culture to, to honor people who have reached the top of the academic field that they are studying in. Yes? Yeah. And, we, and we trust that given the training, they, they have been cadets, they have been uh, trainees up to this point, but with the inauguration ceremony, we, in, we inaugurate them into their field and we trust that they will, they will always act in the in the standards of the of the field. Um, so this is the kind of thing that we're dealing with in interpreting proverbs. They are not simple. They are not easily interpreted. You've got to do far more 
than we are accustomed to doing with the Proverbs. We just memorize a proverb and spit it out when it seems to fit the circumstance. We don't think about them. Um, so we need, we need this background in order to understand. There are various kinds of Proverbs. I've gone through the Proverbs trying to, to, to apply this material to them. I'm not sure how, well, how useful this is. I think I might um, omit this from future versions of this PowerPoint, uh, but there are seven um, categories that uh, R.B. Weiss Scott uses to talk about the, the Proverbs, and they do fit in some measure. I think you have available to you this PowerPoint or the, the earlier one that we used last time, and this material is on that too, so you need not worry about not getting this. Um, what I want to what I want to focus on today, though, is proverb for the rest of our time. The uh, instruction genre, um, instruction genre has a has a variety of um, signals, elements of the text that help us understand that we're dealing in instruction genre. This is a discrete kind of wisdom literature. It's different from the proverb, which typically is two lines and you're done. This, this goes over a substantial portion of the biblical text. And so we'll, we'll talk about this for the rest of our time today. First is the main element, an imperative, positive or negative. Um, and, and this is, these categories are established for the, for the Hebrew Bible but some kind of instruction, some kind of direct instruction. You, you are giving a command, you're giving some kind of instruction to the student. Second, there is direct address. In Proverbs, it's often introduced by my son. Uh, turn to Proverbs chapter one and uh, verse eight. I have the first two elements immediately at verse 8, Proverbs 1, 8. Listen, that's an imperative. My son, direct address. <laughs> uh, third, there is often an example to be imitated or to be shunned. Um, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Don't reject your mother's teaching, for they will be a garland to you, and so on. Verse 11 gives us the example to be imitated, in this case, shunned. If they say, I'm sorry, verse 10 actually is where it starts. My son, if sinners entice you, don't be persuaded. If they say, come let us, uh, come with us. Let's set ambush and kill someone. Let's attack some innocent person just for fun. Let's swallow them alive like Sheol, whole like those who go down to the pit. We'll find all kinds of valuable property and fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us and we'll share all the loot. My son, and now you get back to the instruction. Um, notice that verse, um, verse um, 11, uh, verse 10 also has a conditional clause they say to you. <coughs> So conditional clauses, addition, they define the conditions or circumstances in which the imperative applies. If there are motive clauses, look at verse 9 in, verse, in chapter 1. Why should I do this, Dad? For they will be a garland of favor on your, on your head and pendants around your neck. Here's a motive clause. Uh, this especially is meaningful in, in, in the society in India, because whenever we have the, the uh, final sessions of our, of our uh, conferences in India, you always give us garlands that go around our, our necks, and, and they, it, you honor us uh, far beyond what we deserve, but, but you are very generous. Uh, but, the, but this is the same kind of thing. You say it's a similar culture. Some motive clauses, they may quote excuses to show their invalidity. There is sometimes in the motive clause antithetic parallelism. Does that communicate what, what is antithetic parallelism? 
What's the opposite of it? Say it again. Synergy. Synonymous. Yeah. The opposite of antithetic is synonymous parallelism. So you may have antithetic parallelism in the motive clause. It, it, it recommends the imperative uh, to you and demonstrates its reasonableness. Um, it may be placed before the imperative to, to soften up the hearer. Here are some good things that will come to you. Now, this is how you get them. <laughs> uh, um, oy vey. Uh, then there is a consequential clause that shows that the imperative is effective. Um, let me see if I can find uh, verse 15 of chapter one. My son, don't travel that road with them or set your foot on their path because their feet run to, toward evil and they hurry to, sh to shed blood. It's useless to spread a net where any bird can see it. But they, but they set an ambush to kill themselves. They attack their own lives. And you see the negative example here that the, the son in the instruction is to avoid and why he should avoid it. Verse 19, such are the paths of all those who make profit dishonestly. It takes the lives of those who receive it. Um, so consequential clauses. Um, Usually, instruction genre is marked by plainness of speech or absence of figures of speech, especially in the imperative clause. More common in motivation and descriptive clauses, uh, they are characteristic type of simile. This pattern may be seen in Proverbs. And what I want to do for the rest of the time now, having introduced this, is to kind of give you the, the overview of instruction and then go to chapter two and work through it in a little more detail. Proverbs one to nine are all instruction. Um, Bruce Waltke, whom I've mentioned on too many occasions, you're weary of hearing his name, but, but Bruce Waltke has written probably the finest present day, finest commentary on Proverbs available. Um, and he makes this statement about uh, instruction genre. The prologue consists of 12 poems, 10 lectures put into the mouth of the father and addressed to my son, and you have those laid out, and two interludes, extended ad addresses by woman wisdom, a personification of Solomon's wisdom to gullible youths, so in 120 to 33 and 81 to 36. I also have, and the book of Proverbs clearly does uh, introduce this as, was, as instruction, mm -hmm. Proverbs 22, 17 to 24, 22, a, a rather remarkable passage. Roland Murphy, a major scholar in wisdom literature studies, says that the passage ends in 23, 11. I'm not sure who's right on this, <laughs> but, but we'll, we'll uh, accept this and work with it. But you might turn to Proverbs 22, uh, or 22, 17, and uh, let's look at it just by way of introduction. Um, so Proverbs 22. My fingers will not turn pages well these days. Proverbs 22, verse 17. Listen closely. Pay attention to the words of the wise and apply your knowledge, uh, my, your mind to my knowledge. For you can see the categories that we've been talking about just now. For it is pleasing if you keep them within you and if they are constantly on your lips. I have instructed you today, even you, so that your confidence may be in the Lord. Haven't I written for you 30 sayings? about counsel and knowledge. Your text may not have 30 sayings there. That's a, that's a thoroughly legitimate translation of the Hebrew text. Um, and I won't go any further with that than, than to say um, there is a, a very, very interesting parallel in Egyptian 
wisdom literature to this passage. We'll just leave it at that and say no more. Um, but the passage then is instruction. And so the, these are basic uh, kinds of, of uh, teaching. An, an overview of the book of Proverbs, uh, the title and, uh, uh, and prologue in, in verses one to seven, introduction, introductory instruction genre for wisdom, one eight to nine eighteen, the Proverbs of Solomon, the sayings of the wise, and I have the name Amenemope there, further sayings of the wise in 24, Solomonic sayings gathered in Hezekiah's day in 25 to 29, the sayings of Agur, the sayings of Lemuel, uh, 31, 1 to 9, and the excellent life passage. Now, there are two questions someone's going to ask, who are Agur and Lemuel? And the answer is, I don't know, so don't ask it. <laughs> That's as much as I can say. I have no idea who they are, nor how they got included in the book of Proverbs, but there they are. Um, what I want to do now is, is to move back and talk to you about um, um, instruction in Proverbs 2. And if we have time, we'll go into chapter 3. Um, in Proverbs 2, uh, by the way, let me add, uh, Waltke talks about Proverbs in a unique way. And we mentioned this last week. Um, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job are... He, he likens to the American educational system. Uh, the early grades we call an elementary in, uh, in American system. So from age six to, to age 12, you're in the elementary grades. And he calls instruction genre elementary education and wisdom. You don't have to think deeply in order to understand the instruction genre of the... Uh, thank you, whoever uh, solved that problem. We appreciate it. Um, you don't have to think deeply about what's going on in instruction, instruction genre. You're giving basic instruction and wisdom to the youth who is starting on the way to wisdom. When you get to chapter 10, you are moving to junior high or um, what we used to call junior high, ages 13 through um, 13, 14, 15, ages 13 to 15. Then in Ecclesiastes, we're getting into high school and college. Ecclesiastes is more advanced at, uh, instruction and it's very difficult. Ecclesiastes has things in it, as does the book of Proverbs, which appear to be self-contradictory. And we've already pointed out one, one such passage in Proverbs 26 today. Um, and you will, we'll deal with Ecclesiastes in a couple of weeks. Uh, about three, we'll start Ecclesiastes and move on. Uh, but then Job is graduate school. So if, uh, if instruction is in, uh, elementary instruction, and if chapters 10 to um, 31 are more advanced instruction, Ecclesiastes is, is, is undergraduate and Job is graduate instruction. So we're moving along a trajectory toward more and more difficult uh, teaching, more and more difficult to understand teaching. So let's look at chapter two. Look at verse one now. My son, here's the direct address, and here's the condition. If you accept my words and store up my commands within you, here's a condition. You, you've got, son, you've got to pay attention to what I'm saying. 
but you you accept my words the in the esv translates and that's a good translation here what does it mean to accept my my words it's more than memorizing them because there there are things you've memorized that only years later you come to understand yes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so you memorized them, but you didn't accept them because you didn't realize what they meant. And so at some point in subsequent years, you come to understand what they mean. And the effect of that is you think, oh, my goodness, I never understood that until now. So if you accept my words, there, there has to be a receptive spirit to gain wisdom. You can't just hear words and do them. It's not a mechanical process. To some degree, it is. Um, when I was starting out in music in fifth grade, um, I played the string bass. And the, the conductor, the teacher, wanted me to hold the bass up and put, put my fingers down on the strings and pull a bow across the strings, watch him, and tap my foot all at the same time. Well, I couldn't chew gum and, and walk at the same time. <laughs> so how am I going to do five things all at once? And I thought he was crazy. But, but you know, as I worked at putting my fingers on the strings and moving them on the strings and bowing, and tapping my foot, and reading the music, and watching him, all at the same time, I learned to do that over time. It didn't make any sense to me at the beginning. So there is, in a, in a sense, in the beginning of instruction, in the beginning of wisdom, there is a mechanical repetition that is essential. But it's not merely the re mechanical repetition. Um, I have developed a particularly good sense of peripheral vision because I played in orchestras for so many years. I, I started in 1960, 1950, uh, what, 1957, playing in orchestras, and I played in orchestras until 1970. Um, uh, and that means one of the things you're doing when you're playing in an, a, a symphony orchestra is you must read the music, watch the conductor, watch the section that you're in, listen to the people around you so that you can, you know that you're playing the right thing. Are you with me here? And if there's a soloist, you must play softly enough that you can hear the soloist, no matter what the, what the loudness marking of the tech, of the, of the music is. So you've got lots of things to pay attention to, and that means I, I can now walk and read and not run into things because I have good peripheral vision. <laughs> I'm making sense to you, but it was from the mechanical repetition of activities that I didn't understand that I came to a, to the point where I could do these things down the road. Does this make sense? Yes. But if you accept my words is not merely hearing them and repeating them, it's learning to take them seriously. So verse one, if you accept my words and store them, store up my, what kind of things do you store up? Things of great value. Things of great value. Important okay. things. Later. Things. Things that are necessary for life, for example, food. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So things that are necessary, things that are important, things that are, that are valuable. These are the things you store up. So if, if you ask your wisdom student to store up my words, it's, it, he must recognize, the wisdom student must recognize that these things are essential to life, they are important, and they're valuable, and you must treat them that way. So I have, I have things that I have 
stored away in my bookcase over here behind me that are old and they are important to me. They're valuable to me. And I don't take them out and look at them regularly because they're fragile, but I have them where I can get to them and I can show someone when it becomes important to do that. Um, but this is what we must do with wisdom. Verse two, <laughs> listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart toward understanding. Uh, what does it mean to direct your heart to understanding? What, what is the heart? Seat of all desires. A seat of all desires. Good. Anything else? Can it be called soul? Say again? Uh, can it be called soul also? To, to some degree. I, I don't really understand what soul is in the Old Testament. Um, and I don't understand it at all in the New Testament. <laughs> I have a kind of very basic understanding of soul in the Old Testament, but not in the New. Uh, Passion. Passion. Uh, heart. Desire. Heart is the core of your personality. It's where you are with no pretense. That, that's who you are. So Proverbs is going to say, um, the wise has a heart, but fools lack heart. Your, your Bible may translate, they lack understanding, but there, there is no core in a fool. It's like the difference between a, um, an artichoke and an onion. Uh, when you peel the layers of an onion back, eventually you get down to nothing. But an artichoke, is that something you have? You may, you may have it, but not call it by the same name. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about, an, an artichoke? No. Okay. Well, it's a it's a green. I don't know whether it's a fruit or what. It has a large seed inside, and it has spiny leaves on the outside. And you 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 peel. You don't apparently you don't. I I don't like artichokes. That I don't. I wouldn't eat them for anything. But but you peel them back, and you get down to the heart of the artichoke, and that's where you eat. That, that's where the good stuff is. So an artichoke has a heart, but, a, but an onion has no heart. And that's the difference between and the fool. There is no core reality to the fool except folly, and the folly means death. So if you, as, as verse 2 says, direct your heart to understanding. I can't get understanding by treating it trivially. I can't treat wisdom trivially. I can't say, Okay, I've got to read this today. I have a friend who had his son copy out a chapter of Proverbs every, every week uh, that he was growing up uh, after he learned to write. Um, I haven't asked him about this. I think I know the son that, that did this. That son got into drugs and has abandoned the family and makes no contact with the family. Um, but he copied out Proverbs, a chapter of Proverbs, every week growing up. He didn't direct his heart to it. It was a mechanical exercise. There was nothing, yeah. there was no attention given. Verse 3, Further, furthermore, if you call out for insight, and lift your voice for understanding. I don't know Indian culture well enough to be able to to. to know for sure, I suspect I know, if you see your friend, multi tens of meters away, will you, will you yell out his name and try to get his attention, or will you hurry over to where the person is to get his attention? The latter. The latter. Same thing in America. I wouldn't yell across a, a, a street, unless it was absolutely essential to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but under what circumstances would you yell? Under what circumstances would you cry out a number of years ago? 
um, oh, this was a long time ago, it was 30 years ago or more. And the man, it was a very wealthy man who was entertaining my wife and me for the afternoon. We preached in a church on Sunday morning and we're to preach on Sunday evening. And so he took us to his home and gave us a nice meal and gave us time to relax before the evening service. And he said, I got something in the trunk of my car. You got to see. And I said, what, what is it? And he said, well, come out to the car and I'll show you. We went out to the car. It was, it was a very fancy, very expensive car. And it had a, uh, a, uh, uh, a burglar system, burglar alarm system attached to it. And he had to disable that. And he said, this is the safest place in the house. And he opened it. There was a, a big object. I can't, I can't show you how big on, on the screen. I, I'm not far enough away. There was a large, uh, maybe two thirds of a meter long piece of something wrapped up in towels and he unwrapped it and it was a large silver block. And I thought, well, that's strange. And it really wasn't even very attractive. He said, do you know what this is? I said, I have no idea what it is. He said, it's an ingot of silver that was discovered in uh, the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> that was taken from the, uh, the wreck of the Spanish galleon Atocha. Uh, he said, I was an investor in the, in the process of searching for the Atocha wreck. And when they, when they brought up the treasure, this was my, um, this was my part of the investment, the, the return on my investment in the process. Folks, people died searching for the Atocha. Okay. Are you with me? And that was just to get silver and gold. It may cost you your life in a world of folly to pursue wisdom, but you got to search for it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure. You will spend every, if, if the treasure is great enough, and if the return on the investment is great enough, you will sacrifice anything you have to get it. So you have to know how valuable wisdom is in order to understand why and how you can sacrifice everything to get it. If you search for it like silver and, and like hidden treasure, then, and here is the consequence that follows, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. This is what it's going to take. You're going to have to give, set aside all public shame. You're going to have to direct your attention to it in ways that transcend simply mechanical repetition. You're going to have to, to let it risk every resource you have in order to get it. But if you will, you will come to know uh, the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Now, how can I know that for sure? Here's the explanation, verse 6. Is it, is it certain that I will gain wisdom if I will pursue this? And the answer is verse 6. The Lord gives wisdom. Um, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding so that he may guard the paths of the of justice and protect the ways of his faithful followers. If you will express your desire for wisdom in the ways that the wisdom teacher has suggested, then you're guaranteed to get wisdom because God always responds to this kind of, of person by giving wisdom to them. Um, so verse 9 then another good consequence that follows from the search for wisdom, then you will understand righteousness, justice. And uh, you, what, what do you have in integrity in my text? Equity. Equity? Yeah. Yeah, equity uh, in every good course. Yeah, the, the Hebrew word for equity entails the notion of giving to each person what is proper, properly his due, properly his share. <clears throat> I expect at a major event that you might be hosting and you, you invite lots of people to the event. There are people who are set in, in proper places and others 
who who are seated wherever they can. Is, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's equity. When you, when people who are honorable are placed in honorable positions, and people who lack honor are put in places where there is no honor, then you have you have learned equity. Every good path for, and here's another reason why you can be confident that you will gain wisdom. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will delight you. Discretion will watch over you, and understanding will guard you. I will rescue it will rescue you from the way of evil, uh, from um, anyone who says perverse things. You will be inherently sensitized to evil and perversity, and you will understand it. You will recognize it imme immediately. Uh, from those who abandon the right paths to walk in ways of darkness, from those who enjoy doing evil and celebrate perversion, whose paths are crooked and whose ways are devious. It will rescue you from a forbidden woman, from a wayward woman with flattering talk, who abandons the companion and so on. Um, verse uh, 20. So follow the way of good and keep the paths of righteous of the righteous, for the upright will inhabit the land. No, notice here that Proverbs is dependent upon, like we talked last week, it's dependent upon the teaching of the books of Moses. How do you know that the righteous will inherit the land? Because it was promised to the, to the, to the righteous. And notice that wisdom and righteousness are rough synonyms in this context. So if you're righteous, if you're, if you're pursuing the fear of the Lord, then the promises of the Mosaic Covenant will be granted to you. Once again, observe that wisdom literature is not absolute truth. It is general truth. This is not something that is a promise to us because we're never promised to inherit the land today. It's oh. in the kingdom that we inherit the earth. Romans chapter 4 and verse 12. Uh, it's in the kingdom that we inherit the earth. Um, so this is not a promise to us. It's a promise under the Mosaic Covenant. Um, so verse 21, for the upright will inhabit the land, and those of integrity will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous ripped out of it. Is that always true even in the Old Testament? And of course, the answer has to be no, because we're going to get to Ecclesiastes in a few weeks. And one of the things that Solomon says in Ecclesiastes is that I, I look to the place of justice, and behold, I found injustice. Well, if Solomon is king, why doesn't he oust these wicked judges from their position and put righteous judges in? And because he's king doesn't mean he has absolute power. There, there are people he can, he can deal with, and there are people he cannot for political reasons. Yes, then sound right, and wisdom literature does it. That's what, Paul, that's what Solomon is going to say. Paul wrote the whole Bible. So Paul wrote Ecclesiastes. That's, that's, this is why Paul, Solomon is struggling. He, there, there are limits to the power even of a, an oriental monarch. Uh, so, how do you how do you deal with these things? Um, this is instruction genre, and uh, if we were to, able to get into chapter three, we would see some of the some of the other rewards of of, of um, wisdom. But uh, uh, we'll stop at this point. Next week, we're going to go on into the uh, the material that follows here, the way of wisdom. I'll send Brother Timothy the, uh, the PowerPoint so that you will have it. This, all this is already in the PowerPoint that, that you have available, I think, but uh, you'll, you'll have the same form of it if you want to look at it in that way. So let's stop now and we'll take any questions that you have. There are two kinds of questions. There are good questions that I can answer, and then there are bad questions that I have no answer for. <laughs> wow.
I have a doubt uh, rather than a question, sir. Uh, in one of your slides, I think it is in uh, uh, slide four. Uh, uh, we are connected cosmically. One sentence is there, a second line, I think. Third okay. point of the, uh, we are connected socially and cosmically. Yes. So can you please uh, explain it? Yes. Uh, Proverb, see, see, in the old covenant, um, one of the things God promised when they were faithful to the covenant is that they would get their, their rains and their seasons, for example. But if they abandon righteousness, if they abandon the covenant, then God will send rains at the wrong times and drought. <clears throat> uh, so there is a cosmic connection in the covenant between Israel's relationship with God and Israel's relationship with the land. Um, so that's standard. That's, that's Proverbs is picking up on that and is pursuing that. So go back sometime and read Leviticus 26, read Deuteronomy 28, and see the curses of the covenant. When Israel is righteous, then God gives them penalty. He gives them um, agricultural and, uh, 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 prosperity when they are unrighteous, he, he with, withdraws them. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more thing is uh, when we are talking about wisdom and understanding, if you uh, generally think the people we don't have knowledge about God, Bible, and uh, they are uh, rather uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, in the different fields, they, they are able to use, uh, I mean, uh, uh, invent things and explore things. So what is that we call that? Do we call it wisdom or knowledge? I think, are you getting my question, sir? Yes, there is an aspect of wisdom to that. Uh, so one of, we had the name Amen Mope on the screen a few minutes ago, uh, A-M-E-N. E M, Amen M, Amen M, A M E N E M O P E is the name. Amen M O P E uh, is a wisdom document from ancient Egypt that is, at least in the opening verses of chapter uh, 22, uh, 17 and following, in that passage, it's they're virtually direct quotations from the wisdom of Amen M O P E. The, the Sumerians had wisdom literature. The Babylonians and Assyrians had wisdom literature. Egypt did. And wisdom is wisdom wherever you find it. So as we say in the United States, even a, a blind turkey can find an acorn once in a while. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, the, the fact is that people who observe the way the world actually is created and act in, in line with the created nature of the world um, are people who have gained some wisdom, but it's not the fear of the Lord. All of yeah. it ultimately depends on the fear of the Lord, but some aspects of wisdom are, are accessible to the non-believer. Okay, okay. Thank you. Other questions? have some books of uh, wisdom literature in Apocrypha. Uh, uh, it's a, it itself is called a book of wisdom by Sirach. Ah, and yes. a book of wisdom by Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Yes. That, that's the same so, one. Jesus ben yeah. Sirach. Yes, it's yeah. the same. Yeah. So, uh, uh, are they also uh, can we uh, what we say uh, can we depend on them or are they related to the wisdom literature now what we are studying? Yeah, I read through that that last year. <laughs> uh, it you, you have to test it by scripture. Uh, and and they say things that that we would not agree with scripturally. Um, let me, let me uh, quit sharing that screen because we probably don't need to see it anymore. 
Yeah, oh. I did that. I did that. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, it's interesting and may provide some background for understanding the New Testament. I'm not sure that that I would um, deeply recommend the the uh, the book of Sirach. Uh, it, it was tedious for me to get through. So <laughs> the only thing that I can guarantee any real value from is scripture. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Alvin. Uh, is there anybody speaking? Anybody would like to ask any questions? Sir, uh, some people are saying uh, uh, Pro Proverbs 31 chapter here, Lemuel means uh, uh, King Solomon. Is it wrong? Say that, say that again. Here, uh, 30, uh, 31st chapter of uh, Proverbs. Oh. Uh, Le Lemuel means uh, some people saying he is uh, King of uh, Solomon. Is oh. it wrong? Okay. If it is, Who's Lemuel, basically. Who, yeah, if if he is Solomon, it's not clear in the text. That's that's an assumption. Next, I don't know who he is. Okay, sir. Uh, another uh, another question is uh, uh, the uh, difference uh, um, uh, between uh, among the meanings knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sometimes when we get synonyms, we want to make a clear and, and sharp distinction among the synonyms. That's not the way the Bible works or normal communication works. If I want to emphasize something, I may heap one synonym up to another in order to say, I'm giving you the whole sphere of what this is about. So I'm going to give you wisdom and knowledge and understanding and <laughs> insight and <laughs> discernment these are all aspects of one thing and so don't try to make a hard and fast among your different the texture doing that um, we don't do that in common communication uh generally uh, so uh, god is communicating with people who who do these things kinds of things. So literatures in several languages and you always do this. They, they do it the same way. Uh, so uh, don't, don't try to make it this yeah. Thank you. I think that was a good question because I think many people have that question of how to understand these terms because they, they seem like synonyms, but uh, at times it appears like people try to define all these three things right. in a different way so yeah it's a good one a good one thank you uh, is there anybody else who would like to ask any other question related to the topic you know uh, ah uncle please go ahead okay i think i don't know what i'm going to do i don't know what i'm going to do yes okay uncle i'll stop the recording and then Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So we are, we're still on recording. So once this is done, uh, we can uh, speak about that. Maybe can you, can you? we'll finish. But one uh, urge uh, that I would like to have for the group is, uh, please uh, try to preach from uh, uh, wisdom books, if possible. If you are a preacher, try to get some uh, feet into the wisdom literature and try to work on it. I read it. And then probably we might have good questions uh, that emerge out of our uh, wrestling with the text. Uh, so that way, I think we, we will benefit more. And especially since we are uh, going through Proverbs right now, and you know that uh, we will be going uh, forward, we'll be looking at Ecclesiastes and maybe Song of Solomon and books like this. So not Song of Solomon, but yeah, Ecclesiastes. So uh, please look at those things and uh, uh, try to see uh, if you uh, can engage with the literature and see what difficulties you have 
uh, definitely we find uh, it difficult to interpret those uh, uh, books or that genre because the, it is not like parable or other narrative literature. So please do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, you may end up having difficulty and uh, you may end up in mystical thinking that there might be some hidden meaning in this and we may go away from what the intended meaning is. So that's just an encouragement from us. Uh, One more question. Think about these things. Yeah. Uh, maybe the, yeah, let's One take page. this final question uh, from Brother Thompson. Uh, no, no, yes, please go ahead. Um. Brother, uh, Proverbs 120, it says, wisdom calls aloud outside at the city gates and all. And after a few chapters, the same wayward woman also uh, stands at the city gates and calls. Yes. Uh, why is that uh, both a similar way of calling? Yes, great. Uh, that, that's a, a fascinating uh, dynamic. Um, you have two great, um, concepts that are vying in wisdom literature, wisdom and folly. They are, they are personified as uh, women. So lady, Dr. Waltke calls her woman wisdom uh, and woman folly. I would prefer to call lady wisdom and woman folly. Uh, so especially in chapter nine, you have the two women who offer two banquets uh, and they each invite the fool to join the banquet uh, and give them promises that that will come but then follow uh, uh, the results that if if you pursue that way so they are uh, lady wisdom is probably as as dr walke says lady wisdom probably personifies with the wisdom that solomon has gained and Lady Folly, or this woman Folly, is this strange woman, chapter 5, chapter 7, who uh, wanders the streets and tries to snare young men and, and lead them off to destruction. Uh, so uh, you have these personifications that are at, at work in the thing. And uh, by the way, Chochma in Hebrew is um, feminine. And uh, I think it's Neve La, Folly. Is um, is also feminine, so the right personification would be woman. It's not um, the woman folly is not a, a degradation of what women is. Are otherwise, woman wisdom would also be a degradation, and yet she is the exalted one. Uh, Proverbs eight we didn't deal with. Uh, Proverbs eight wisdom is created. It this is not Jesus. <laughs> So wisdom is a created thing. And so the, the effect of this is that uh, wisdom is the first of God's creations. And the outcome is that, that lady wisdom is the, 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 the darling child of the Lord, as, you were, as it were. And so calls the fool to embrace that way. I'm not sure I answered your question, but, but I, I talked a lot. <laughs> wow thank you thank you for that thank, you, thank, you. thank you for that response Dr. Alvin. i was i was just thinking is it safe to say uh both the women are personification of wisdom and folly and uh, they are inviting the readers to uh towards their side whether uh which woman do you choose or which banquet probably would be better to say or which way would you like to choose is the option that is laid in front of the people who are reading the text. Uh, uh, if that is safe to say, that's what I would like to add to that. <laughs> that's, that that's sound, yeah. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alman. And uh, uh, folks, I uh, really want to reiterate what you're getting is gold. Uh, <laughs> we rarely get such stuff. So please encourage your friends and family to uh, follow these lectures. And you yourself, if you see a need for another recap, please do go to the YouTube channels and, and try to get this. We don't grow suddenly listening at one sermon or two, but we, I think definitely will grow uh, when we uh, sit in classes like this. You will you'll see the difference moving forward. So yeah, uh, thank you so much. And I will request uh, Sukumar uncle to kindly 
uh, pray uh, for the group and also for Dr. Aumi uh, as he has other assignments in the week. As he said, uh, he'll be at a conference. Please pray over him and also for our group and uh, others uh, also to be inspired to join our <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, with hearts full of uh, gratitude, we come to your presence, Lord, for uh, giving us an opportunity to be taught by a man of God who put in a lot of hard work in a humble way to learn your word and to teach it us to us, to pass it on to us. So help us not only to be hearers of the word, but also doers of it. May this teaching and uh, the understanding be a blessing to many people through us. So we thank you for our dear Dr. Jim Malman, for Brother Timothy and all those who participated and all those who are endeavoring to, to pass it on to others so Father. Once again, grant us an opportunity, if it is your will, next week to follow your, your word and be blessed to Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Uncle. And uh, thank you, all the group. Good night. We'll, uh, we'll request the group to stay a minute, stay on for a minute, and then we'll have an important announcement to make, and then you all can leave. Okay. <laughs>